I thought we could all enjoy a little bit of classical music, but revisited in a more electronic form. I actually enjoy um, writing uh, music also. Uh, but the reason I presented that was to just talk about the fact that typically when we talk about visualizations or computers in general, we tend to dismiss anything that is more than a few years old. We want the latest, greatest. But then we can find really some uh, gems uh, in the history of visualization. Now, speaking of history, what is interesting is that for the stem and leaf plot, we just need one thing, the digit, the numbers, 0 through 9. However, we can improve on that uh, in certain ways by adding some graphical elements. And uh, so from, and uh, just mentioning the numbers, from medieval times all the way to the 14th century, the changes were quite abrupt and uh, many of them. However, from the 14th century uh, up to our day, uh, the digits in our uh, type of scripts, the glyphs are the same. So it got to a point where people were comfortable with it. And what it means is that really it's effective. So as far as uh, graphs and bar charts, we can find some as early as the 1300s. Uh, Nicole Dorem uh, in a Latin manuscript, which was uh, printed, this is a printed copy from the 1480s, introduced some of these uh, charts. And really, it is to talk about, uh, it says latitude in bus, which really, it's the uh, uh, horizontal movement or uh, the velocity and acceleration. Even before Isaac Newton, he, he was considering these things interesting, right? But there are also elements that are tabular or graphical in, or semi-graphical, but are not stem and leaf plots. So if we look at, for example, bus transfers or timetables in general, look like they are arranged a little bit like a stem and leaf plot. And even though Wikipedia might tell you that there are some stem and leaf plots that are timetables, in reality, the, time, uh, the stem and leaf plot is supposed to be a distribution plot, and the timetable is not. The purpose of it is not that. So it's, it's a little bit different. However, they do look similar. In fact, uh, in one publication from 1919, we see uh, this uh, chart. And if I zoom in a little bit, we'll see. And these are numbers. And I could uh, have uh, also had uh, maybe perhaps area charts, and we would have seen uh, perhaps a legend on the side giving us more detail, but we had to go back and forth, back and forth. Here we see the numbers directly. Uh, but again, it's not quite a stem and leaf plot. And if we continue over, here we go, 1946, uh, Dudley had uh, a book for engineers where he's uh, basically producing a transcription table. So that transcription table has columns. However, since they are not stacked, it's not yet quite the stem and leaf plot. And of course, uh, as far as graphical representation, sometimes it's very valid. In fact, uh, Jacques Bertin in 1967 introduced uh, a book that in English is named uh, The Semiology of Graphics. If you don't have a copy of that, I would definitely recommend it. It's a great book. And he introduced some concept of sorting based on visual cues instead of sorting by value, like by age or by amount of theft in this case, which was the information that he wanted. And then he could see uh, some kind of linear relationship across. So sometimes it's worth it. But we can also go overboard when we are doing graphics. Uh, Roberto Bacci in 1968 introduced his concept of graphical rational patterns. So this is a little harder to read than numbers. Everybody agree? All right. So, I mean, it was an interesting concept, but perhaps taken a little too far. So in 1970, in the classroom, John Tukey introduces the stem and leaf plot. What's interesting to note is that, to this day, it is used in the classroom and as early as the fourth grade uh, in North Carolina, I believe it's starting in the fifth grade that they introduced them to this plot. If we continue in 1972, he published a paper 
that gave a little more traction to his concept in uh, basically a, a book uh, in, uh, for uh, George Snedekor, some graphic and some graphic display. And of course, in 1975, uh, Hoagland, a colleague of his, uh, wrote um, some Fortran code to be able to generate the stem and leaf plot. But really, this is the book in 1977 that he ended up publishing with the stem and leaf plot, and it also covers the uh, box plot. So again, this is kind of one of those uh, very important book in the history of uh, statistical graphs as far as uh, that is concerned. But there was a danger lurking. And what is the danger? It comes in the form of something we called a floppy or a floppy disk. Yes. And why is that a danger? Anybody wants to venture a guess? Well, in 1977, the Apple II came out. Initially, it was with cassette, so storing data on cassette was kind of awkward, and nobody would want to store a lot of information because you weren't sure you were getting it back. However, with the floppy, now you could generate with your computer pseudo-random numbers and create large amount of data. Well, big data for the time, right? I mean although it's probably about 100K here. Still, that meant that the democratization of computers, such as the Commodore 64, even less expensive, or in businesses like the IBM PC with its CGA color display, uh, that was basically trouble for the stem and leaf plot because it was text on a console, green screen, right? And at most 300 data points. What do we do beyond that? But at the same time, there were some uh, people that were holding on into the beauty of the design. Uh, understanding robust and exploratory data analysis mentioned several points as to why it is so effective. And I won't go into all the details because we wouldn't have time. Uh, and Edward Tufte, also in the visual display of quantitative information, makes a mention how the glyph of the digit is so effective. And of course, he's a big fan of data to ink ratio. So if you're putting ink on paper, it better represent data. In fact, I experienced that firsthand talking to him, and that was kind of a, all right, I got this incredible new plot. I'm going to show it to him, and he's going to be like, oh, yes, this is marvelous. And that's actually not what happened. So <laughs> he said, uh, well, your font is horrible. What kind of font are you using? And, well, the colors, wow, they are way too intense. You know, dim that a little bit. And so that was uh, the message that he uh, gave me. So I went back home and was like, okay, well, I guess he's right. Because we are so caught up sometimes in the technology or whatever we've been working on that we're focusing on one aspect. But in reality, we have to look at everything. So we worked on that and continued on. So if we look at um, perhaps a demo, right? It's better than just always talking about these things. First, distribution plot. Uh, I'm sure you know most of them. I won't go into the detail of the data that I'm capturing here, but basically Medicare payments uh, for 2012 and you know your typical pandas um, manipulations. We'll look at uh, one HP HCPCS code, which is 94640, which represents a nebulizer treatment. Let's see if I can bump the font a little bit. And if we run a histogram, well, we have kind of an idea of the distribution, and it appears that uh, uh, there were um, charges from maybe zero, we don't know for sure, all the way to, well, perhaps 400, but we can't really tell, right? If we look at other distribution plot, or perhaps you're familiar with the ROG plot. Um, basically, these little lines, each line is an observation. And of course, when they are very dense, such as on this side, it's hard to actually see the individual detail. Strip plot, same concept. 
but there are also distribution plots that are pretty effective, uh, such as this one from Seaborn, that goes into a bit more detail. Plus, it allows us to do secondary graphs, such as a, perhaps a KDE in this case, or a KDE in a rug plot combining. Oh, yes. Perhaps I should mention the last one. The box plot, right? Another, um, actually, as I mentioned, John Tukey's invention there. So this data gives me a lot more detail, but uh, some people don't like it. Uh, personally, I like it, but um, what do you do to get from that point to actually see the data? Well, so the stem and leaf plot allows you, and this is the output of stem graphic here, allows us to see the individual data point. So on the uh, extreme left is the aggregate. Uh, it's a count, so uh, basically it's telling me how many records I got in the first row, up to second row, up to third row, so on, all the way to the top. It's saying that I have 900 data point in that little uh, chart here. And I can actually read the individual values. I can also tell you that $40 is the median right here, and that $50 seems to be a pretty popular uh, payment that is uh, requested. And all of that from the little distribution plot. So let's dig a little bit deeper into that. So STEM Graphic is a Python module installable from uh, pip3 install STEM Graphic. And if, once you install it, current version is 0.3.3. You can also get your help on it on the package itself or on the individual uh, functions. There's also a command line tool that's uh, associated with it. And the command line tool allows me to, for example, I'm listing, I got oh, one Excel file here. I will run stem on the Excel file and stem automatically looked at what's the first uh, numerical field that is not looking like an index. Unfortunately, that one wasn't very exciting, but I know for a fact that there are some dollars in the seven column, so I'll pass that and see what I can see there, and now it goes from 20,000 all the way to 200,000. Of course, I'm on the command line, so it's text, but uh, there are other methods of, or functions available. One is stem hist, one is um, stem KDE, stem line, and stem graphic itself. So when I started looking into that, I actually I was reading over uh, last year, over the holiday, uh, John Tukey's book, and I was like, why is it not used? And I started looking, and on Rosetta code, there were like hundreds of different implementations in every language you can think of. And so that was the data set here that they were using. It's a list, a plain Python list here. And uh, so I decided to see if I could replicate that. and. It looked uh, pretty nice overall. And uh, of course, I decided that I should be able to change the colors of the different elements and make it a little more flexible from that perspective. It also works on synthetic data or any data, really. Uh, in this case, I'm just generating uh, NumPy arrays. And the data here will be uh, rendered. In this case, uh, I decided to replace the bar by uh, underline in orange, different color. It's pretty simple. I just add a few keywords to uh, do that. There's quite a bit of flexibility. Or I could do a histogram, a black histogram, uh, like this. Of course, now I've lost my significant uh, glyph, which is the digit. So I can no longer see the exact values. But because it also is uh, using matplotlib in this case, it can use save fig and save to a PDF, SVG, PNG, or whatever other format that I would like. What about if I like R and I want to do my data munging in R? Well, I can do that too. And in this case, I just wanted for the brevity, I put it in the same notebook, but it could be in a separate notebook. But in this case, I'm actually using uh, R magic uh, from RPY2. Uh, and that way I can pull which I did two things here, right? I, let me bump the size a little bit. I actually got 
the data set empty cars, motor trend cars, classic, and I got just the car weight from uh, that set, and then also I got the whole Quake set, which if you've attended the tutorials yesterday, there was one tutorial that covered that uh, set in particular, so I figured, well, let's include that one too. And so if I uh, plot that, I actually see the multi-model uh, approach here. And again, we have quite a bit of uh, data here. We have actually 900 uh, points here again. If I look at the car weight, there was only 32, and that's because the set only includes that many. Uh, but I can clearly see the min and max here, which are about 1,500 pounds and uh, 54, 24 pounds for the heavier vehicle. So again, I can do some uh, basic and not so basic quick uh, look at my data this way. I can even, hey, I did mention I would introduce a new programming language you hadn't heard of today, or maybe you've heard of it. It's Coconut, which is functional programming in Python, compatible with Python, actually. So I can actually use Python statements and do a pipeline. In this case, I'm just pushing from this side all the way to STEM graphics. So I'm actually sampling 100 from this list that's generated by this here. So it's kind of a convoluted example, but just to say that, yeah, there's a level of compatibility if you can bring it into your notebook environment here. All righty. Uh, briefly on the design and implementation, I just wanted to mention um, it looks fairly simple, but when you start looking at how to count the number of bins, and you'll see in the performance demo why that is important, the number of bins is how many uh, data points you'll accumulate in each, or how, how you're going to slice and dice your data. And if you don't get it right, you can get from uh, somewhat informa uh, informative visual display or, from, or to basically, okay, this is useless to me. Uh, so that's pretty important to look at that. So I took a hybrid approach based on the number of points that are to be uh, uh, counted. So for a smaller data set, I, I take one approach. And if you want more detail, it's in the little booklet. And if you didn't get a copy of the booklet, there's a few more copies. So after uh, the talk, uh, feel free to stop and grab one. Okay, number of data points. This is where you're wondering, this, this guy is talking about 300 data point, 900 data point. I have a million data point, or 750, or 150 million, or a billion data point. What can this tool do for me? Well, so this is where uh, sampling and other techniques come into play. And um, I won't go into the detail yet. I will continue on to the next uh, demo, and it'll make a little more sense. Uh, one thing also, so of course, there's you have to consider when you create a new visualization, how am I going to inform the, the reader or the person looking at this, this chart how it works? So a legend, that's important to have. So we spend some time thinking about that. Well, I'm saying we. I mean, it was me, basically. <laughs> so. Um, secondary plots also, again, because we saw in Seaborn how, that can, how convenient that can be. In fact, you could uh, maybe in Seaborn maybe have a normal curve or a double gamma and all that and compare and it's like, oh yeah, this exact same distribution, right? Persistence. So since we are sampling, one of the interesting features is that maybe you don't want to do the data wrangling. It handles quite a bit already. It figures the first column. It'll take that, it'll sample. It would be nice to be able to save that sample and then just have it for the visual display that I can continue my analysis uh, from that sample. Uh, particularly if I'm talking about a set that's a billion records, I don't want to have to query that uh, too often. And the defaults. Well, I mentioned, you know, uh, as uh, Tough T mentioned, oh, font ugly, color too bright. So you, you have to think about these things. Performance demo. When I say performance, there are many aspects of performance. One is the speed at which things run. 
Um, but also, so I just loaded um, 700,000 records, look at the histogram. So pandas has a very fast histogram. It also has a plot that will, by default, do, it looks almost like a histogram that's not sorted, so I could, in theory, maybe sort it and have something useful, but it's also a little slower. According to time it, once it's done, it'll tell me it takes about five seconds per, oh, 4.37. So that's actually a little bit better than usual. And I actually am running everything off of a little USB hard disk external, just so you know. So now I'm importing Seaborn and we'll look at the disk plot that we uh, demoed earlier. Oh, what's happening? Should I panic? No. I know actually what's going on. Uh, basically, Seaborn is telling me that there are values that are undefined right here. And so what I have to do is drop in a before I actually called the plot itself. So if I didn't know that, well, I would lose some time or so on and so forth. So let's see how it did. Ooh. It looks like just one bar. There's a little bit of detail here, and I can see the max value, but there's not a lot of information on this screen. And so that's too bad. Let's see how STEM graphic does. First of all, it took 200 milliseconds about the same or a little faster than this plot. But let's see what it did find for us. So the minimum value is zero. The maximum, and I shrunk the screen so you guys can see here on the screen, but it's 5.26, uh, so on and so forth, million dollars. And I can see the individual data point. I can see my median. And so I get, I get really uh, some informative uh, display with basically default behavior, except for uh, me adding the random state so I can reproduce the same graph for every time I do this presentation. And it ran it multiple times. Uh, so let's make Excel cry. 12.5 million rows. Uh, New York City, yellow taxi trips data. For 2015, we'll look at just because this is a live demo and we won't have that much time, we'll just run on uh, one month. So 12 million rows instead of 150 million. And so just I have a little class here to time this. By the way, if I were to look at the data through word count, uh, anybody familiar with word count? And while word count does its thing, uh, WC is basically just doing that exactly. It's giving me the number of um, lines, words, and bytes in that file. And it took 7.6 seconds, which is pretty good for 12 million records, right? It's a pretty big file. And uh, so if we uh, run um, stem graphic on the same data, of course, I have to load it in uh, pandas. So it'll take a little while, obviously, right? But what it will do is it will go through that data, figure out what's the minimum, the maximum value, how many records are there, and we'll build the graph. Oh, it actually came back in 17 seconds. Not too bad. So uh, I knew that. So, <laughs> All right. So, so we did get uh, uh, an output fairly quickly. Now let's look at the larger data set, and that's the 150 million records. I, as I mentioned, I've already run this because it takes a little longer. Even uh, just uh, looking at a word count on this and timing it, it ran it a few times and the best time was 4 minutes and 50 seconds. So that's a C program optimized for doing one job and it took almost 5 minutes. Pandas, if we loop through the 12 files and just read them, and that's all we do, we just load them into memory and then go to the next. Took eight minutes and a half. And the last one, stem graphic from disk, again, running this. Now, here's what's happening. Because it is way more than the RAM on the laptop, it requires 60 gig of RAM minimum. Actually, I was able to load it on one node 
uh, that has 64 gig and it was able to load all the data for New York City 2015. So it's bigger than the RAM. So Pandas will not work. So I'm using, what's that DD thing that I'm using? If we go back at the top, import Dask data frame as DD. And so Dask allows me to have a da data frame that's on disk. In this case, however, even better than this is that I could also, instead of doing read CSV, I could do it from HDFS. So if you have a Hadoop cluster or basically any cluster that has HDFS capability or you could use S3 or so on and so forth, then you can actually pull the data and you can, whereas this took uh, six minutes, you could actually, given enough node, make this interactive. And that is pretty significant. Of course, there are other uh, visualization tools that are able to handle very large data. Uh, Sarah mentioned Data Shader uh, yesterday. Um, but again, this is a tool that's very simple to use. Uh, the only difference is that instead of using my Pandas data frame, I'm using the Dask data frame for very large set. And STEM Graphic knows about that. Now remember I said sampling, I'll go back to that. So in terms of the sampling, uh, what's happening there is that Dask actually does things a little different than Pandas. In fact, uh, if I could make one change, uh, I might suggest a, a, a one change uh, to the code. Uh, I had to use a fraction and not the actual number of samples I wanted. And what that means is I'm required to get the count of data, do the division to get the fraction that I want and pass that to Dask and then execute that because Dask is building just uh, intent and then you have to do dot compute to actually do the thing that you want to do. So it's built in into STEM graphics. So it knows about, as I mentioned, uh, lists, NumPy, it knows about data frames and Dask data frames from that perspective. And again, um, as I mentioned, performance is not just about the time it takes, it's about how good the tool is. I mean, if I have to spend another hour drilling and figuring out what it's spitting out to me, then that's not really useful. But these uh, graphs are used on a regular basis. And uh, really, um, it's very effective. Uh, one of the things that I've built also is that when it samples and it gets back and it calculates the ratio and it's tried to figure out how many rows or in columns and how it will look, if it thinks it's like, no, that's not going to be visually appealing or unusable, that means there's a good chance that the sampling uh, hit one of those edge cases, right? I mean, there's always, if you sample enough times, you'll get a sample that's not really representative of your data. It happens from time to time. So what I did is I just added something very simple, which is a secondary sampling. Um, I would love to see people try to pass their own functions uh, and try to experiment with that and see what else uh, can be done from that perspective. So that's uh, part of the future work. And since I've put everything on GitHub, then you can also go and uh, help out and uh, try to figure out. There's quite a large to do actually. So uh, maybe uh, speaking of large, I need to bump it up a little bit. Um, again, uh, so that means that um, you can actually look at the code, try to figure out how it works if you want, or just use it as it is, pip install, and you have access to it. It's only tested on Python 3, and you might think, wow, that guy is kind of like not uh, friendly, right? Um, just to know that uh, many of the projects are actually all aligning themselves to uh, basically start offering uh, within some months or even a year in certain cases, uh, Python 3 only. And since I had a limited amount of time to develop this, I figured, well, I've been using Python 3 for exclusively for over a year now, I think it's okay. So, all righty. So that pretty much concludes the presentation. Any questions from the audience? All right. Just w wait for the microphone. So sometimes there's more than one line, like there's like 
a, a blank line uh, that doesn't have a number next to it. Yes. There's a bunch of stuff on the right. And I wasn't quite sure how to interpret that when that happens. Yes. And uh, so in the booklet, it explains a little bit more. But what it is is that uh, John Tukey, when uh, when he designed his uh, stem and leaf plot, he defined uh, from the get-go three different approach uh, to this. One is the simplest, which is just I have uh, the, the, the digit and the first uh, on the stem. I, I do so stem dot leaf times the scale. Let's say the scale is 100. So I have 2.1 times 100, 21. Um, in the case of uh, plots that are maybe too squished and you want to gain a little bit more vertical so this is the number of bins that a histogram would calculate in this case what we do is split from 0 to 4 on the first or if there's no data it actually just skips it if it's the first line at the bottom or if it's the last one at the end and it's uh, 5 and above so 0 to 4 5 and above I mean 5 to 9 on the second line there's actually one more uh, even uh, more split uh, graph uh, tr uh, plot and that goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Already this, uh, when you go and split it, um, what I've found out is that people have a hard time associating which line goes which which. And so I don't use it much beyond EDA work. So when I'm exploring data, I'm looking at the data, I'll use maybe the, the split, but if I'm publishing for uh, somebody, if it's appropriate, if they actually want to see the number. And part of the future work that I pointed at is research in perception, which is one thing. Also research on persuasive power of text and graphical elements. Because it's been shown that if you have uh, a lot of visual aspects, but not a lot of numbers, people are wondering a little bit more about your data, if it's true or what, but if particularly in financial uh, areas, and whereas if you have a table with a bunch of numbers, oh, this looks very serious. So apparently there's, there might be uh, an impact by having you know, visual and colors and at the same time the actual numbers on the chart. That's an unproven theory at this point, but it would be interesting to look at. Thank you, great talk. Um, the stem and leaf plot was really designed for typographic representation data. It's a static thing in today's age with interactive graphics. Have you thought of perhaps having just a histogram, but if you mouse over, it becomes a stem and leaf and people can see the data, so it becomes more interactive that way? Yes, actually, uh, so I've been talking with uh, Sarah quite a bit on Bokeh, and I've actually been using Bokeh for uh, quite a while also, but I didn't feel comfortable enough uh, with it when I started that, which was back in January of this year, uh, to uh, try to do that right away. Uh, I had some you know, more algorithmic problems to solve, uh, the distributed computing issues, things like that. Uh, but yeah, definitely it's uh, also in, on the big to-do list on the GitHub repo, definitely uh, interactivity would be uh, quite marvelous for sure. So thank you for this. Um, when I look at this, uh, I see like a visual representation of like descriptive, like a descriptive statistics, right? You've got your min, max, you've got your distribution, maybe it's a standard, DV, you know, you can sort of visually see what you might get in like a descript, you know, like Panda's description. Um, but descriptive, that, that can always hide, um, that can hide part of the nuance of a data, like what, um, what do you like to combine this with to really get a sense of your data? Um, what do you think it's good for? What do you think it's not good for? Yes, okay, so first of all, and like transactions and dollars and things like that tend to have a distribution that uh, it lends itself well to these things. Uh, I've been looking a ton at Medicare data, things like that, and you see patterns. It's like it raises question, uh, things that you didn't expect to find necessarily. It's like why is there such a peak in this area? Why, why this number 
shows up so many times. This is like not normal. There's something weird there. And for sure, it, I would want to investigate more. So there are some areas like that that work out uh, pretty good. Um, when you have very few data points, I mean less than 30, I don't think it's worth the, the effort to uh, or the time to use that. Uh, and there are data that basically just a, a table is the best approach. I mean, you just have some numbers that you want to show uh, and that's the, the goal then you know might as well do that but when you do want to uh, again uh, salaries house prices um, so yesterday there was a tutorial uh, Don and I did on house prices and you could clearly see the, the distribution of the house prices in, in Seattle based on the data and it was fairly informative so right away you can see these uh, patterns emerging now even better would be maybe to combine uh, you know clustering and colors based on these clusters and things like that automatically then it would provide even more information obviously and because it's a graphical representation then that should be possible so. all right I think if we don't have any more questions then our time is up let's give a big hand for Francois Dion for